Thank you, Chris, and uh, good evening, everybody. It's really good to be back with you. Um, I think it was 2007 that I first spoke to the Society, and I, I tended to come along on an annual basis through until the COVID uh, lockdown. And I mean, that, that was a, a dreadful period for everybody. It was really tough to get through. And so it's, it's fantastic to actually be with people again. And uh, I hope you've all managed to stay well through that and uh, uh, keep going. Uh, we're coming out the other side, I hope, now of the pandemic. Uh, Eastbourne really drew, uh, pulled together during the lockdown. Uh, politicians put their differences aside. There was a COVID committee, which uh, I, I chaired on a weekly basis initially. Uh, Robert was at that as well, Caroline Ansell. Um, we had the health professionals, we had the Chamber of Commerce, the Hospitality Association, the Eastbourne Bid. Everybody just came together and, and looked at what needed to be done to look after our community. And I think that's one of the great strengths of Eastbourne, that we are a community that looks after each other and, and sees each other through very, very challenging times. But it's great to be back with you again. I, I'm suffering from just one of the side effects from COVID. I don't know about you, but my... Suits all seem to shrink during the lockdown. <laughs> um, it, what, what I thought I'd do this evening is update you on some of the things that have happened since we were last together, which was actually just over two years ago. Um, and I've got a slide presentation, a PowerPoint slide presentation. I warn you to start with, there are 43 slides. But before you think, oh no, death by PowerPoint, let me say, those of you that know me know that I like pictures, not words. And so a, a lot of this is, is just to show you pictures of some of the things that have happened, some uh, artist impressions of what I hope will happen in the near future. And so we'll rattle through them very quickly. If you want to interrupt me at any time, please feel free to do so. You won't put me off. I don't read a script, so it's whatever comes up when, uh, in my mind when I, I put the, a picture on the, the, the uh, screen there. And we'll do questions and answers on anything you like at the end. Uh, so, without... Let me give you the pointer, because I didn't... Ah, <laughs> thank you. Oh, I do love gizmos, thank Next you. Next one's that one. So, that goes back, that goes forward. Fabulous, let's see. Uh, hey, and it works. <laughs> uh, have I got one of those things where I can... Oh, no, no, I've turned it. <laughs> no, that doesn't work. Ah, that's great, I love that. Um, right, that, that, that's what I thought I'd take you through today. An update on what's been happening at the Devonshire Quarter um, since we were last together, and then uh, talk to you about some of the, the heritage uh, buildings on our seafront and what's happening or not happening with those. Uh, housing development in the town, what we've been doing on housing development and what we hope to do as a council. And then finally, the really good news that we received that following a bid that we made for Eastbourne of £19.8 million under the government's levelling up bid, they agreed to give us that money. So we've got that money to spend between now and 2024. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the detail of that as we go. So Devonshire Quarter to start with. Um, that's what it looks like now as you approach it. Uh, I think that looks pretty spectacular. I mean, there were some real challenges uh, for the architects because as you know better than most we've got two listed buildings there we've got the 1963 listed uh, grade two listed building the congress and we've got the 1880s uh, grade two starred listed building of the winter garden and to try and create something that fitted between those two and looked right was a real challenge but i i, I think that the architects have done a, a stunning job um, this is what it looked like when I was last with you. We'd virtually finished the Congress. We'd knocked down the old uh, Congress restaurant, which we used to freeze in in winter and feel overheated in in summer. And uh, we'd got a hole in the ground. In the Congress, the Congress was looking good by then already. We were just opening up to the first shows. Uh, we had the, uh, the, the, the London Philharmonic were the, the first people to, 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 to actually be live there, uh, as they were back in 1963. The, the work that's been done, um, people say, that's how it used to look. And that was the intention. It really was to try and recreate that original building. The difference is the chairs uh, haven't got the big padded backs, 
but they've got far more leg room. So if, like me, you, you like to stretch your legs out a bit, you can actually do it now without having them up around your knees. Um, at the top there, we've got new audio-visual, the, the latest, the highest technology in there. And at the sides, which you can't see here, but along the sides, if you go in, you'll see these padded areas, because I used to get an awful lot of complaints uh, because the Congress was built actually more as a conference venue than an entertainment venue. And so when you had music or uh, opera or something like that, the sound quality was not good, the acoustics were not good. But the architects have managed to tackle that. So you've got these boards that flip around, they're hard on one side and they absorb the sound on the other. So it, it really is a very good experience, whatever you're going there for. And inside, uh, that um, is what it looks like today. And you'll see the furniture that was modelled on the furniture that from the photographs back in 1963, as were the lampshades. The lampshades, um, we took them from the photos, they were uh, purpose-built by a local firm, so really good, using local industry and recreating something rather special for the town. Um, back to that hole in the ground. Uh, that's what the view looked like again about two years ago. And I've got to say that I, by that, at that time I was just slightly nervous because as we dug down we found water coming in and uh, that, that wasn't so good. Um, but we overcame that. Another view of the hole in the ground and of course those rather rusty roofed buildings there were the <coughs> exhibition halls. And we have a lot of conferences. One of the great income earners for Eastbourne are the conferences that take place. And what we used to have, people coming in via the Congress, and then a finger post that said, exhibition this way, which walked you through the Congress restaurant, through the Winter Garden, and to the halls at the back. And lo and behold, not many people actually bothered to go to the exhibition halls, which meant the exhibitors who fund the conferences didn't really want to come back. Now, of course, they come to the, the new welcome building. The idea being that everybody comes in through the welcome building, whichever part of the Devonshire quarter you're in, intending to visit. Uh, so you come in through there, you walk through exhibitions almost without realising you're doing it. And all of the buildings are now linked at all levels. So you can get from Towner to the Winter Garden without having to go outside. There are lifts, uh, so people who have got uh, physical disability and challenges in terms of mobility can get to any of the floors with ease. And that didn't used to be the case. You'll remember probably that if you went to the Winter Garden, if you had the need to go in uh, using some sort of uh, a wheelchair or other device, you used to be pointed to a little uh, gate at the side, big iron gate at the side, and go in and go into a rather small lift. It made people who had got those mobility problems second-class citizens, and it should never have been the case. And, and so that's been overcome. That's the, what it looks like now. One of the bugbears, because you, there's always something that you, you look at and you think, that doesn't look quite right, and it's great shame. A lot of people have been trying to get a shortcut up there and have been managing to trample down some of the shrubs. We've made some, put some signage there to try and discourage people from doing that. Um, in hindsight, you might say, well, maybe we should have made a path there. Hindsight's always a wonderful thing, isn't it? But we, we didn't. Um, that's the inside. Uh, hopefully a lot of you have been in, or most of you may have been in already. But that's the inside of the Welcome Building. Very modern, very sleek, uh, very energy efficient. And so uh, if you're in one of the meeting rooms there and it starts to get too hot, you don't have to go and play with the uh, controls on the wall. The windows open automatically. And if it gets, starts to cool down, they close automatically. Uh, then on the outside, of course, you've got this rather nice... Uh, terrace that runs from the front to the back and at the back you've got the views over the tennis courts. Uh, those old Devonshire halls, the exhibition halls I spoke about and showed you, those have been removed. That's been returned to grass which has really pleased the Lawn Tennis Association who really like us uh, and will be coming back year after year with the pre-Wimbledon tournament. So that, that's good news. 
But what they wanted was not more courts, but courts with larger runoff because of the, the power of the Serbs these days. And that's, uh, as the evening draws in, that, that's what it looks like, all lit up, uh, and really rather a spectacular way, I think, of showing off Eastbourne at its best. Then we move on to the Winter Garden, and that's what the Winter Garden looked like. Uh, obviously, some work still to be done there at that stage. Uh, this is all the before, so rather like the Congress, it was gutted. Uh, last time I came to show you, see you, I showed you some slides of the inside of the Congress with the scaffolding up and uh, everything where it had been gutted there. Same happened to the Winter Garden. That's the floral hall that you'll, I'm sure you'll recognise. And there, work taking place, the stage. And now we see the floral hall as it is today. Um, if you look there, in the, the, there at the roof level, th those panels that I've just circled, those are again uh, panels that absorb the sound. So one of the challenges used to be, if you had a meal there, like, uh, as this is laid out for, um, it, I, I sometimes find it very difficult to hear in a room where a lot of people are talking at the same time. And so I, I find I'm only picking up bits of a conversation. But one of the things that will help me and others, I'm sure, is the fact that that will absorb a lot of that sound so people will be able to have their conversations at their own tables and, and hopefully be able to hear far more. But uh, the floor, you see, what used to be there two years ago was a rather old, very sticky carpet. Um, and so we pulled that up, and what we found underneath was this wonderful teak floor, probably 100 years old. And that was sanded down, and if you look at that now, you wouldn't know that that is a 100-year-old floor, would you? That, that looks as if it could have been laid last week and really very, very impressive. Um, it was a little bit touch and go as to whether we'd managed to get it finished in time for the first event. Uh, I was in there a week before, and they were still painting the gold, uh, but they managed it, and the, the people who worked on this did a, an absolutely splendid job. They've restored it to its former glory. There's the new stage, new lighting rig, uh, new technology in there, so as with the Congress, as with the Welcome Building, latest tech, so that we can attract uh, bookings that other venues would uh, be, be very, and will be very, very envious of. And even the toilets. Um, <laughs> so th th there you go, we, with everything inside has been done out. The kitchens uh, cater for 15, 1,600 people, and uh, th th they also look splendid. Uh, so that, that's the Devonshire Quarter. The, the final bit of the Devonshire Quarter that's still to be uh, worked on is, of course, the outside. Um, the, there's an, an issue as to just exactly what that will look like, but I've got a meeting coming up with Richard Crook in a, a couple of weeks' time, and we're going to explore just how we can try and re-establish re, uh, uh, re the former glory of the outside of the building. But the, the side elevation, the bit which uh, faces the, uh, the, the welcome building, has already been completed. Moving on to the seafront, seafront, um, members of your society have uh, often contacted me about some of the issues on the seafront, and so I thought it was important that I update <coughs> you on where we are with those. Um, we have the Environment Agency who have contacted us recently, and they've said that they have got a project which they termed initially as 100 million pounds. We know it will cost a lot more than 100 million pounds, so don't get hooked up on that figure. Um, it's a project to improve the sea defences from Hollywell to Cooden Beach. The first tranche of that is four million, and it sounds an incredibly large amount of money, to develop the project over the next two years. And th this is the time scale that they've given us. Uh, project options to be developed between 2021, July 2021, and spring 2023. Now, I, I, I'm probably going to be a little bit unkind to the Environment Agency because historically when I've tried to meet with the Environment Agency, I've found that very difficult. I've not found them to be the easiest of organisations to engage with. But I, in, in fairness to them, we met about three weeks ago, they made a presentation to council members 
and I found them to be very open, very uh, keen to engage with the community and hear ideas from local people about how this project <coughs> should progress. And one of the uh, groups that I've asked them to con uh, consult with is your society. So if they haven't already been in touch, Chris, hopefully they will be in the, f in the very near future. And if they're not, let me know and I will give them a nudge. Um, by summer 2023, they hope to have their preferred option uh, selected and approved. They'll have the detailed design uh, commencing in summer 2023 through to spring 2025 and then the construction starting in spring 2025. So we're, we're still just a, almost four years away from the actual work going in, but the sea defences are such that when they showed us a map of Eastbourne, uh, I, I suddenly realised that uh, I was going to have a swimming pool in the garden, um, and I was very worried that they might show the map to my insurance company because uh, <laughs> I can see my premiums going up uh, v v very high indeed. Unless some of the sea defence work is done, it really is very, very important to the town. So that has an impact on our buildings uh, along the seafront sea and the heritage buildings that we have. One of those, of course, is the bandstand. Um, and we don't want to do anything... Uh, massive there if there's going to be a need to change some of that as a result of what the Environment Agency are doing. So what we're doing at the moment, uh, we've got some money in the budget and we'll be dealing with the health and safety issues at the bandstand over this winter. But the bigger work there, and the bigger work, when I talk about the bigger work, I believe it will probably be somewhere in the region of £4 million that will be needed. To, re, to totally revamp the bandstand and to bring that back to its former glory. Uh, one of the, uh, the, the ways that we might be able to fund that, and we'll be talking to them, is through the, um, the uh, Heritage Buildings Fund, which is aimed at providing money to small geographical locations, such as Eastbourne, where there are a lot of heritage buildings, but you know, the local council of our size, with our net budget of £13 million pounds, which couldn't be uh, expected to fund all of the work that's needed to look after those heritage assets that we as a, uh, a community are fortunate enough to have. Another uh, issue along there, the redoubt, requires major work uh, to the services and some elements of the structure there. Uh, the good news, or potentially good news, uh, uh, is that uh, there's an emerging commercial approach there, and uh, our chief executive, Rod Cottrell, is in discussions with uh, someone who do doesn't want to be named at the moment, so I can't, I can't share more details. I'm sorry to tease. Uh, but uh, someone who is very, very keen on heritage, uh, is uh, reasonably wealthy and uh, philanthropic and uh, is talking about doing some work there which could be very good. So we'll, we'll hopefully be able to share information on that with you in the not so distant future. Just wanted to let you know that there is work uh, being, some work being uh, considered and again that might come under, some of the work that's needed there might come under the uh, bid that we'll make uh, to the Heritage Building Fund. Um, one thing that I've had quite a lot of letters, emails, telephone calls, of course people find all sorts of ways of finding me, um, uh, is the seafront lighting and the need for <coughs> replacement of the seafront lighting. And I, I thought that was going to be a relatively simple task. I didn't think it was going to be vastly expensive until we tried to do it. And then we found, and th this is one of the few slides that's got lots of words on, uh, that when we conducted a proper survey and I, I don't imagine you'll all be able to read that right back, so I'll read this to you. The issues, the underground cabling supply, the lamp columns between the pier and the wish tower uh, of life expired. The control gear and the enclosures need replacement. Uh, the cast iron lamp columns are corroded with loose and missing access panels. And consequential failure of lighting both on columns and the festoon as a result of that. So what are we planning to, to do about it? We're looking at works, phase one of the works, November of this year, so just starting now, through to March next year, we're going to excavate and lay new cable ducts along the middle promenade uh, between the pier and the wish tower. 
we're going to replace uh, 18, we're replacing the order to replace 18 of the cast iron lamp columns to the Eastbourne pattern. And uh, for me, that's important. That's part of the heritage again. And uh, phase two of the work from April 22 to July 22. So certainly if you're kind enough to invite me back next year, hopefully uh, the, uh, the work will be complete. We'll be replacing the existing lamp columns, installing new cabling, feeder cabinets and switch gear, fitting new lanterns, uh, globe lighting and festoon lighting. So um, where are we talking about? You've got two sets of dots there. Um, the blue dots on the C-bound side, uh, the, uh, those represent the lamp standards that we have a, a responsibility for as Eastbourne Borough Council. The red ones are part of the highway network and they're the responsibility of East Sussex County Council. So we're talking about the blue ones. That's the, where those 18 go. That's the beach, see? Um, 18 columns to be replaced on the middle uh, parade between those two arrows. And that's where we'll be digging the trench. So there's going to be some disruption, so please bear with us during that disruption. It is essential if we're going to get that lighting right, and we'll be doing it in fairly short order. Uh, that's what the existing columns look like. Uh, as you can see, not only are they looking pretty shabby, but over a period of time, different people have decided that it's a great idea to hang all sorts of other things off them. So they don't, they're not something that I'm proud of, and I'm sure that you wouldn't be either. But that's what we're looking to replace them with. So it's back in the old Eastbourne style, <coughs> new columns to match the existing pattern, but with larger access panel to allow new control gear to go in. Low energy LED uh, lantern globes and festoon, and wiring and connection simplified. Paint finish as the existing, uh, back again in the corporate Eastbourne Eastbourne fashion. A uh, little bit of about housing, sorry, can I just take a sip of water? David, can I just uh, ask mm. a question? Now, I was particularly interested in the lighting yes. aspect because it was one of the things that attracted us to mm. Eastbourne because the seafront is so um, incredible here. And we look out over the, the illuminated bit of the seafront, so we've watched with interest what's happened with the lighting over the last couple of years. Is this sort of information available on the council website? I've, I've got to be honest and say I haven't checked, but I'll make sure it is tomorrow. Right, okay. <laughs> because I just know neighbours say, you know... Yeah, no, 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 you're, you're, you're absolutely right. That, that communicating some of the things we're doing is always perhaps something we can improve upon. Uh, so I'll take that back. I'll make sure that we provide this information uh, on the website or via a hot link so people can see what's happening. So it is good news. It is going to be very different by this time next year. And uh, back to the sort of uh, Victorian style that we've enjoyed uh, and uh, made us proud of the seafront. Um, housing development in the town. Um, I've talked to you before about this site that we purchased. Um, it used to be, of course, uh, our direct works um, depot. And uh, we, we sold it, um, it probably about 25 years ago now. And we sold it to a housing association for £5 million. Um, they didn't get around to developing it. They kept promising to, but never did. They, Back in 2007, when I became leader of the council again, I walked the site with their directors and they showed me their grandiose plans for it and they never developed it. They sold it on to another housing association for what was reported to be £4 million. Um, and they didn't develop it either. And they were kind enough to walk the site with me as well and show me their grandiose plans. Uh, so I, I know the ground very well. <laughs> Uh, I also know that the Victorian Water Tower, which is a really key feature there, has sadly become very badly vandalised um, and needs a lot of TLC. Um, we, back in 2017-18, purchased it off that uh, housing association for £1.5 million. So something we sold for £5 million, we bought back for £1.5 uh, so don't you know, think that councils are not always entrepreneurial and uh, sometimes we can get the monies right. <laughs> um, but uh, financially it stacks up. 
We then got a grant to allow us to deal with the contamination work uh, because we knew there was some contaminated work, so it, it almost came to us for nothing. Um, but we are going to be developing it. We're going to be, and there's a, an image, an artist impression of what it's going to look like. There are going to be some challenges with the development because over the last few months since uh, COVID uh, hit us, the construction industry, pr prices in the construction industry have been going uh, high, much, much higher. I've tried to avoid saying going through the roof, uh, but, <laughs> but you, you know what I mean. Um, and uh, so the, the costings of it will need to be kept under very serious review. But we're looking at uh, a total of 96 uh, properties, residences there in that space, including in the water tower. So we'll be uh, revamping that, keep getting the water tower back looking spectacular again and dealing with the vandalism that's taken place. And this is what's known as the foundry. Um, for those of you that know Eastbourne well, you'll know the top end of Langley Road near Seaside. Um, and the, there were a row of shops there, small retail units, and a couple of them have been closed for a very long period of time. Final ones closed not so very long ago. And they're in the secondary shopping area. And to be honest, certainly since online trading's taken place, as a whole as a town, we've probably got too, many, too much retail space. And so we allowed this to be converted into residential. Uh, it's, <coughs> excuse me. It's a council development, and we've, it's the very first modular build that we've had in Eastbourne. And it's through a local, I say local, New Haven-based company that have got a lot of, built a lot of experience very quickly around modular, modernize, uh, modular build, uh, a company called... <coughs> excuse me, Boutique Modern. And that's what it looked like um, about a year or so ago. And they brought in this enormous crane. Um, and I went down to watch them lifting the different modules and putting them in place. The speed with which that happened was incredible. So you go from uh, uh, virtually a hole in the ground to having a property almost within a space of hours. And you can see the way that that's taking shape now. Um, then, finally, I want to just take you through the levelling up fund. I say this is extremely good news. Uh, the government offered uh, an opportunity to bid for money to uh, local authorities around the country. They put them into different categories uh, under what they considered the need to sort of level up. And Eastbourne was fortunate enough in that sense to be put into the first category, which meant that we had the opportunity to bid for um, projects valued up to £20 million. Um, that was the cap, 20 million, and the, the bid needed to be in in very short order, so it had to actually be in by June, and we only learned about this uh, during the late spring. And the way that we tackled this, uh, a group were put together, and that was led by Christina Eubank, who's the Chief Executive of the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, there was an invitation went out for ideas of what we, we should spend this money on, should we be fortunate enough to get it. Um, and a lot of very, very good ideas came forward. A group of our officers, um, led by a guy called Peter Sharp, who's our economic development officer, put uh, a lot of time and energy into filtering through those ideas and making sure that what we bid for met the government criteria. I've got to say there were some excellent ideas in there which are not in here, but they didn't meet that criteria and there was no point in putting in a bid if we weren't going to be successful. So what we ended up with was a bid that everybody came together and approved. So it had the uh, support from a uh, Chamber of Commerce, from a Hospitality Association, from Caroline Ants, or our MP, from a South Council leader from South Downs National Park, from Towner, all writing letters of support. And we learnt just a couple of weeks ago that we were successful. And £19.8 million is game-changing for Eastbourne. And this is how it's going to be spent. So up at Black Robin Farm, and I, I know that many of you will be familiar with Black Robin Farm, just up at Beachy Head, uh, we have the farm there. And th what will be happening is we'll create an education and cultural space. So the education facility 
will be uh, managed and run by the uh, East Sussex College Group. And they will be aiming at particularly at young people who perhaps have not um, done particularly well academically, but may have a creative uh, element to their makeup which allows them to do something differently and creative. Uh, so, so there will be an education facility, there will be um, a, a food facility there, but using the ex pretty well the existing barns, the only things that will be knocked down will be the 1960s barns, which don't look particularly good at the moment, and they will be replaced with flint barns going forward, so it'll actually improve the, the appearance of this. There'll be a cultural facility, and that will be led by Towner. So uh, Towner are looking to put a gallery in there, and I believe that their intention is to have a permanent Revillias collection there, which uh, I, I know that many of you will know Eric Revillias, and uh, many of us have wanted for a long time to have some sort of permanent display of his works. Of course, we've probably got the greatest collection of Revillias works in the country. Uh, so that, that will appear there. Um, they will then create a cultural tra trail, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But uh, at the moment, there's a tenant farmer there. I've got to say, the tenant farmer has been extremely helpful, very cooperative, very supportive of the, uh, what's planned. Um, Victoria Place. Now, Victoria Place uh, is the new way of describing, or perhaps even the former way of describing, the top end of Terminus Road. Terminus Road has never really felt right to me because Terminus suggests a railway station where things end. It doesn't suggest somewhere up by the seafront. Um, uh, it's the road, of course, that runs from the, uh, the railway station straight up to the seafront. So at the seafront end, uh, from what is now the Premier Inn up to uh, the seafront itself, that's what I'm referring to when I speak of Victoria Place. Uh, a couple of years ago, or three, year, three years ago now, uh, that one side of that was looking particularly run down. The flats, uh, the Victoria Mansions flats, were looking very tired, very shabby. The roofs were letting in the water. The shops were closing. There were a lot of closed retail units there. Um, it went into administration. The company that were owned it and were running it weren't investing in the repair and maintenance. They went into liquidation. It went to administration and the council bought it from the administrator. <coughs> Now, whilst we hope that that might generate some income from the, for the town, uh, for the council, the real reason, the main reason, was to improve the appearance of that. Because once part of your town becomes shabby, that quickly spreads, and that's not something that we wanted to see happen. So we bought that, and we've invested heavily in it. The flats have all been, uh, you, you've seen the scaffolding moving along. The scaffolding's gone now, I'm pleased to say, so the flats have been restored. The ones above Harry Ramsden's we're using as holiday lets because the views are spectacular. And so if you've got friends who want to come to Eastbourne and want to rent some accommodation, they could do a lot worse than rent accommodation uh, or above Harry Ramsden's. They look east, they're looking over the pier, they look west, they're looking at the South Downs. And uh, we've... Uh, We've kitted those out to a very good standard as well. The rest we'll use uh, to deal with some of our housing waiting list and uh, to, to, as rental accommodation. Um, and at the lower level, you've got the shops, which were so many empty units. We've now got more interest in those, more people wanting to come into those shops than we've got units available, which again is really good news. Um, if you've been down there recently, you'll have seen a uh, new butcher's opened, he's a young butcher who used to work in Hailsham, set up in business himself in Victoria Place and doing really well. He looks as if he's got a tremendous offering when, when I walked in there uh, to just see what, what sort of quality of meat he had. Um, we've got uh, a bakery opening in the very near future as well. So uh, that's the butcher and the baker, so if there's any candlestick makers <laughs> in the room. Um, no, seriously. We have got more people wanting to come into those units and we've got units available. And it, that, that's tremendous. It's go, that alone was going to change the, the feel of that part of, of Eastbourne. But the levelling up fund will make a tremendous difference because going into that, we've got, we're going to have uh, about £7 million going in 
to create uh, an alfresco dining facility. So you'll have canopies going up there and uh, green infrastructure, so you can have heating but not fossil fuel heating throughout the year. The restaurants that are already there will be able to have seat, outdoor seating, as they did during the lockdown. Uh, but it will, I believe that this is going to become a go-to venue within Eastbourne. It's going to be pedestrianised, and we're working with East Sussex County Council on the plans for that pedestrianisation. Uh, uh, now, they're also working on plans a little bit further down the road, uh, from Bankers Corner through to Langney Road, uh, to uh, their next phase of their town centre improvements. So if you think you've already, we've already got the changes that have taken place from the railway station to Bankers Corner, you've got the East Sussex County Council about to do another phase from Bankers Corner to Langney Road, closing off Bolton Road, closing off Langney Road. You'll have this at Victoria Place. The only bit that needs to be dealt with then are the bits around TJ Hughes, Debenhams, the Curzon. But if I was an inward investor looking at a town centre to invest in, with everything that's happening around it, that would be prime site for me, me to want to invest in. So I, I'm hopeful that we'll see progress there in the not too distant future as well. So that, that's Victoria Place. And the final part of it is Towner. It's Towner's centenary coming up. So uh, Towner are very excited about that. They will be getting some money out of the levelling up fund to do some refurbishment work within Towner and they'll be working with uh, the project at Black Robin Farm. So taking some of those works of art that, you've, uh, that will be created by those young people who will be educated up at Black Robin Farm and creating a cultural trail through Eastbourne. Uh, so from the Downs, down through the seafront into the town centre but beyond the town centre. So getting to some of the parts of Eastbourne where we have perhaps more disadvantaged communities, uh, places like Short Shine Water, where you've got um, uh, th th things that are part of our heritage, part of our history, but are not really well recognised or understood, such as the Bronze Age settlement. So uh, th th this will link up, link together, an awful lot of parts of Eastbourne through the Leveling Up Fund. So uh, a lot of uh, work ahead of us in a very short space of time. So it was originally due to be completed by uh, the end of March 2023. Government were a little bit late in announcing it, and I believe that they've now decided to let us go into 2024 for that completion, which gives us a little bit more breathing space. But it's still going to be a lot of work in a short space of time, but it's going to be transformational. So I I'm delighted we've got that money, uh, and uh, I hope to be able to share with you uh, photos in the future of how that's progressing. Um, that is me for this evening. So uh, thank you very much for, you, for, for listening to me. I happily, as I said before, take questions on any subject. It doesn't need to be on anything that I've covered. It will be anything that relates to the council. Gentlemen, there was the first. Thank you. The uh, coastal fences work, um, maybe too early for you to know, but uh, is that going to um, try to help Princess Park? Because I've noticed more recently the water level rising there. And you're right that it's too early f for me to say categorically, uh, but that's one of the uh, areas we'll be making sure the Environment Agency are very fully aware of. And their own map, where they showed the areas that could potentially be underwater um, if action isn't taken, included Prince's Park. So I'm fairly confident that that will be included. Thank you. There was a gentleman there, and then I'll come to the front. Um, I, I was wanting to ask about the parks in Eastbourne. I think there is inadequate maintenance. There has been a lot of use of the parks during COVID, uh, but there is inadequate maintenance in maintaining paths, maintaining structures. And the other thing, which may or may not be the council's responsibility, is trees. That we, in the part of Eastbourne that I live in, we've had a number of trees fall down, chestnuts fall down, and I gathered from other residents who've been here long, longer than I have that there used to be a regular checkup on trees uh, every two or four years. And, uh, but I'm, I'm mainly concerned the maintenance of the parks. They're very well used. People enjoy going to the parks, particularly at weekends, children, 
everything, but there's inadequate maintenance. Yeah. Can you do something more about doing, about getting no, it's, a, it's a fair comment. The parks are our responsibility and the trees within the parks are our responsibility. Trees on the roadside of the county council because they're part of the highway responsibility. Um, in t we've got some good news coming Im uh, immediately. Uh, the Police Crime Commissioner, Katie Bourne, uh, accepted a bid for light, new lighting going into Gildridge Park and that will be installed in the very near future. Uh, we've put some monies into um, some of the other park areas, but we'll look at that as part of our capital programme going forward. I'll take that, that, that issue away. Um, yeah, it, 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 we, we, uh, what we did actually a number of years ago, uh, we had a programme which went and revamped an awful lot of the parks. And so for a while they looked splendid. Uh, it's probably coming up to a refresh. It no, no, no. I think I will make it a personal responsibility to go and look at them and uh, I'll make a note before I go to do so. Uh, the, the, you ask about the inspections of the trees. The trees are still inspected. Um, uh, there's a, one, we've got an officer, Lee Michael, who knows more about trees than I could ever dream of knowing. He's a true expert on them and uh, he, he advises on what needs to be done. So they are inspected. Uh, Owen. Sorry. Um, I, know, I know that the pond has been looked at, but I don't know the detail. But okay. if you right. let me have your email address or your yeah. home yeah. address, I, I will update you on it. Yeah. Owen. He, he's right, he's Sorry. right about the maintenance of the park because the, the hand dryer in the Jensen Gildridge Park has been broken for about three months. I have reported it. If it's been reported, it should be dealt with. But before I go, make sure I write it down. Yeah. Owen. You're talking about the work that's taking place by the two companies who are installing fibre through Eastbourne. Um, yeah. It's, uh, you're, you're right, they promised, and they have a legal responsibility to reinstate and to make good to the, to the level that they were before they came along, or better. The uh, responsibility of holding them to account for that rest with the Highways um, Department at the County Council. I and other councillors have regularly drawn their attention to where this has not been done to a, the proper standard. Uh, they've explained to me that uh, the, whilst the, that responsibility is there for both Lightning Fibre and City Fibre, they are, they are allowed to put in what they call a temporary reinstatement and then come back, revisit it and do it properly. Uh, I will continue to press them, and I know other councillors will as well, because uh, I mean, Robert's there, and I'm sure his post bag's the sim same to, as mine in terms of complaints about this. So just let us know where it's not been done properly, and we will keep badgering the highways officers at East Sussex until it is. What is their timetable? They're, they're, they're allowed. Well, one, um, one of the challenges, Owen, and uh, <laughs> You know, sometimes private enterprise beggars belief, in my view. Sometimes I know that sometimes people say that well, public authorities are not as uh, slick as they could be. But you've got two different companies digging up the road. One comes along, digs it up, puts something back. Might, they might even put it back properly. Um, and then six, month, uh, six weeks later, along comes another, the other one and digs it up again. Now, I've spoken to them and said, you know, doesn't it make common sense for the two of you to get around the table and say, we'll dig up this half of the town, you dig up that half of the town, we'll both lay our cables in the, the, the trench that's there, and uh, then reinstate. You, you know, that would make it quicker, and it would, in my view, save them both money. Uh, what I've been told is that the, they won't do it because they believe that, it, that there could be... Um, arguments over who 
created the damage, if there's damage. So that rather than go, I'm only telling you what I've been told. I, I, I say for me it beggars belief. I, I think there's a common sense element here, but I have uh, suggested it to them and uh, it, it's been, uh, been discounted. So, but let, let us know the roads that haven't been properly reinstated. We will act as your voice with the County Council until it's done properly. Arnold. Oh, <laughs> hold on, Lionel, I need a drink. Would I be correct in understanding that now CAG ceases to be a formal subcommittee of these four borough council that, one, the public are barred from attending their deliberations in an observing only or in a deed, indeed any capacity, two, that no longer are the two delegates to Borough Council Area Conservation Advisory Committee and the one to the Downland Forum delegates of and appointed by the Eastbourne Society. And as such, members of the Eastbourne Societies are no longer to expect reports from external members who may well not even be members of the Eastbourne Society following future annual selections by head of Eastbourne Borough Council Planning Department. Three, how may the general public ever be certain here on in that the words and actions expressed on CAG are what they, the public, want to hear with no further future chance to observe or receive a report? Four, how may the ca caring public now lobby external delegates if we are not told who they are? And how will head of planning set about advertising for the external members of CAG, presuming it will be quite improper for the trustees or executives of this society to recommend any of their members to it. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Lionel. Um, I, to be honest, I don't know the answers to all of those questions, but I'll find them out. My, my belief is that the public can still attend. And if they can't, I will do my very best to ensure that they will be able to in the future because I believe in open meetings and always have. Um, in terms of who those representatives are, um, that should be public knowledge and should be published and I'll make sure that that happens. Um, as to the selection, I know there were some changes that were discussed. Uh, I'll find out exactly what those were and I'll, I'll ping you an email and let you know, Lionel. But uh, now I say I, I've always believed in open meetings. Uh, one, when I first became a councillor some <laughs> 41 years ago, um, uh, that was one of the things I fought for because a lot of uh, both East Sussex and Eastbourne Council met in private. And I, I've never, ever supported that. So uh, I, I shall do my very best to take action on it for you. Uh, Lindsay, I think you... Oh, what's happening with the Claremont Hotel? The Claremont um, is privately owned. They've done work at the moment to uh, make it secure and we're waiting for planning uh, applications to come forward. Originally, the plan they were talking to our planners about having a hotel at the front but with um, residences behind as part of the one build. I think that that may be changing. I think they may be looking for more residential. Um, but uh, as to whether that would be approved or not is a different matter because it's very much within the footprint of the tourism zone of Eastbourne. And personally, I would want to see it restored as a hotel, at least in part. Chris. David, can I pick up on what Lionel was saying about CAG? Yeah, sure. Um, and Lionel, thank you for looking at that paperwork as well. Because when I really got involved in all this lot with the Winter Garden, hmm. um, a year ago, <coughs> there was the first full council meeting on the 18th of November last year. And there was this piece about CAG. And the vote was unanimous by the council to change CAG. Hmm. Now, from what I read there, it was to ask to, to extend its powers and also include it in strategic policy, which is what not... Is it, so it was actually giving CAG some... As I understand this, it was giving CAG clout. Yes. So I have been talking with Chris Connolly, who's obviously the conservation officer, and Rob Cotterou, the chief executive, trying to steer us in the direction, this is why I'm, I'm wanting the Eastbourne Society to have a real big part in the future, 
is I really think we can become involved in the strategic policy of this town if you will let us. And I think that the vote you, got, you had on the 18th, whether it was Liberal Democrat or Tory, it really doesn't matter. It was unanimous. It, it was unanimous, and my recollection of it was exactly as you say. Uh, the, what I, I remember is that there was going to be um, a greater power given to CAG. It wasn't about trying to close it down. Uh, the, the, what Lionel had asked me just now was the first time that that's been raised with me. Uh, so I will happily look into that, and I say I'll get back to you. Um, I mean, the, the, sorry, it's the Conservation Area Advisory Committee. <laughs> my apologies. My, uh, we, if, if I use abbreviations, just pick me up on it. <laughs> Yeah. If I can fill in, you see a report in the Eastbourne Observer every month. Our representative, good old Richard at the back there, I can see him. Nicholas, is he here as well or is he at the Conservation Area Group meeting? I said because obviously... Uh, I think Nicholas was at the meeting. We've just come from it, but uh, um, he's worried about getting infections. So he hasn't come. Right, that's all right. But essentially the Conservation Advisory Group... If anything is in a conservation area, and we didn't used to have them in this town, did we? No. So they were created. So if something turns up, there is an, uh, you look at it specially to say, is this right in this part of town? Now, obviously, the conservation area advisory group might turn and go, no, 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 all the way. It's not like that. But uh, I think there are about six people on it. Isn't that right? There are six people on the conservation there area used to be advisory six group. On. And it goes to four planners that basically go yay or nay. And if it goes to appeal, it goes to a, somebody in Bristol that comes down and goes, sorry, we're building it anyway. No, you're, you're, you're taking me beyond my level of understanding. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I've been asking the questions, Daniel, trying to work out how uh, the system works. No, no uh, uh, my, my belief is that CAG is, was... I know what it was, I don't know quite what it's morphed into, and that's what I'll find out. But it was a group that looked at uh, planning applications that were coming in uh, to uh, the conservation areas. And it would uh, give uh, a view to the planning committee. The planning committee didn't have to uh, accept that view, but it was used as an advisory group. So it didn't, wasn't making decisions, but it was offering advice. Now, I think that's very valuable. I, I, I think your society is very valuable. I, I mean, I lo actually love coming and talking to you, and I'm rather hoping that when I eventually retire, you'll let me join you. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, uh, if, if ever there are issues like that, please come to me and d uh, let me know about them, because I can pick up on them, and I'll do my best to, to find a way through. Lady there. It was mentioned before we've created uh, disabled bays literally just behind Towner. Now you may say that that's not close enough, it's probably all, uh, about as close as if you had a dropping off point on the road. But there are those disabled bays literally just behind Towner. Uh, at the moment there's fencing there because there's still some work taking place, but they will be for people with disabilities to park, not just to drop off but to park. Can they enter from there? They, they would be able. Uh, from the back if, uh, let me look into that because you could get in, you can get in t via the back. There might need to be some arrangement to, to achieve that. But you can get into the back of Winter Garden and you can get into the back of uh, Welcome Building from there. Because it is a barrier. No, no, I, now, I need you all to help me because you, I, I haven't been jotting down these uh, issues and I've made a number of promises to you that I'll follow up on things. So those that I've made promises to, would you make sure you just see me so I can jot them down before I leave, so I don't forget? Um. Please may I also say, last time you were here, we spoke about the trees in Devonshire Place. We did. I know you say it's East Sussex. It those is. trees have still not been pruned. They are massive. And they make it extremely dangerous at night time because they obscure any of the street lighting. The footpaths are very dangerous. Um, the... I, I know it might be the council, but can you please urge them? Because the plan
planters in Devonshire Place have looked dreadful. My friend and I actually cleared, weeded the one close to us to great applause by Hold people on. passing by. But they, it looked so neglected and so shabby that Devonshire Place, which I've been told was one of the prime streets, which is true. should be going down yep. to the seafront, it looks very, very neglected. <coughs> No, uh, I will. Chris, are you recording this? I am. The so, in the back there. Great. If you can give me a copy of the recording, <laughs> yes. you don't need to see me afterwards. <laughs> uh, I, will, I will get someone to, to make sure that they pick up on yeah. uh, and can the. Can I lastly say, of I'm course. delighted that you're calling it Victorian Place because that's what the people born and bred in Eastbourne always referred to it. Yes. And it's lovely to hear that again. Thank you. Yes, please. Yeah, there is. Uh, it's not uh, what I would wish, to be honest. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say, Maureen. Um, the Priory has been sold to a private individual. Um, now, the best I can understand is that they're hoping to return it to being a private residence. So, I mean, it's not that they're going to suddenly try and develop it, or, or what they've, they've said thus far but it, it was sold to a, a, a private individual, which um, takes away a lot of the opportunities that I'd really hoped for it. Yeah. Please. The University of Brighton have indicated that they are having a six-week um, consultation, consultation about leaving Eastbourne. Um, what impact specifically are the um, Borough Council looking at and the impact on Eastbourne as a whole, because we're going to be losing a lot of students and that will be affecting land landlords. It's going to be affecting the employment opportunities in Eastbourne. A lot of students work in Eastbourne. We will lose them and of course the buildings in Meads will be standing empty and will have to be redeveloped. What, is the, hmm. what do you know about it? Uh, I, the first I knew about it was about <coughs> two weeks ago, just under two weeks ago. They didn't give us any prior warning. This was sudden, a sudden announcement um, and uh, it took me totally by surprise because you'll remember a few years ago they pulled out of Hastings and at that point in time I met with them and asked for assurances about Eastbourne and they gave me those assurances. I mean, even to the extent that they said they were thinking of expanding their enterprise in Eastbourne, uh, but they didn't want to say that publicly at that time because it would have impacted negatively on Hastings. Um, so uh, as soon as we heard that news, uh, I contacted Caroline Ansell. We set up a, 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 a Teams meeting together with them. Robert came along to that. Uh, we m made the university aware of our concerns and the ones that you express are absolutely right. It will affect, the, it'll have an economic effect because you've got 1,500 students here. They, their, their spend in the town is considerable. Uh, it will have uh, an impact on employment in the town because uh, to service that uh, through a whole range, not just obviously the teaching staff and the people at the university, but the, the supplies and services that go into that will have an impact. It will change the demographic of Eastbourne. And, and so we made them aware of all of those concerns, we made them uh, aware that we would wish, we, we very much would wish them to stay. They explained uh, their reasoning for wanting to move out, part of which is of course the age of the buildings and the fact that they're not in their terms per fit for purpose for their students. Um, and uh, I suggested, you know, that maybe this was about money. They, they tell us, told us that it wasn't um, but, but, but no, no in, interestingly, there may be some truth there because one of the things I wasn't aware of that they shared with me is that their halls, the halls of residence there, are not owned by them. They're actually rented by them on a long-term lease and so they may well have a penalty clause uh, attached to that and they'll actually have to pay to leave the town. Uh, we took away a lot of information. We've got our officers working on that at the moment and we'll be seeking to meet with them again uh, to try and... Uh, dissuade them. I, I've got to be honest with you, I think that their minds are already made up, but I would encourage everybody here to write in as part of that com, uh, consultation if you share my concerns and your concerns, um, to, to express uh, our, our disappointment and our hope that they will rethink. Uh, we will be going back to them with what we consider to be alternatives within that, that period of time. 
Um, the one thing that we stressed was the sporting facilities they have there here and our strong desire, whatever else they do, that those are attained. Lady there. The town centre is supposed to be cleaned on a regular basis, so I'll check that. Um, no, 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 the town centre is. Um, the town as a whole we changed, and uh, the, the, for financial reasons we had to reduce the, the regular cleaning in many parts of the town, but not in the town centre, so I will check that for you. Um, uh, the, it, what we've done in other places, and uh, I mean I include the road that I live in, uh, if there's a build-up of rubbish, if you ring through, it should be uh, it should be cleared. They should come and sweep, but there's not the routine sweeping which there used to be. Uh, quite often, you'd find, and, and again, I refer to where I live. I'd see a, a street sweeper coming along, but there was nothing for them to sweep because it's actually quite a clean area to be in. Um, so, but it, we've saved some money there, and there should still be the way of uh, method of getting it getting uh, if there is litter left. Get, getting that cleared, but I will look into the town centre for you. Lady over here. What can be done to enforce the bylaws? For instance, uh, bylaws which say no drinking in the town centre and people are drinking in the town centre, or no riding a bicycle along the front and people ride a bicycle, no dog fouling and people dog foul. Um, right, sorry, I don't know if everybody heard, but the question was about enforcement of bylaws around uh, areas where people are not supposed to drink, dog fouling, right. uh, riding bicycles, and other things. Um, the, uh, uh, our Neighbourhood First team uh, have the ability to issue uh, spot fines to uh, people who drop litter and um, uh, aren't for things such as dog fouling, and that can happen. When it comes to such things as cycling and drinking, that's a responsibility of the police. So th there's, a, th there's a, a difference there in terms of how the, the, uh, the enforcement can take place. But uh, we, ha we have actually b uh, issued a number of uh, fines for uh, dog fouling. And uh, what I want the council to do is highlight that a bit more because there's no, no greater disincentive to do something than to hear that people are being fined for it. Gentleman there. Uh, none at all, I'm afraid. He, he doesn't share his ideas with me. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Please. Uh, just one thing that uh, I wasn't aware of is that uh, the council did uh, holiday nets, like you mm. claim above uh, Harry Ramsden. <coughs> is that the only uh, building you've got, or is there other on the portfolio? And where is that information so I can share with my family far and wide? That's on Visit Eastbourne, so that is on the website. And in addition to the ones uh, above Harry Wat Ramsden's, we've got three recently refurbished cottages at Black Robin Farm, which are super. And so if you want to be just a little bit out in the, count, uh, in the country, but close enough to the town, Black Robin Farm's the place for, you, for them. Please. Thank you. Uh, are you uh, able to uh, focus on the development of the old uh, post office or telephone building in Moy Avenue and the uh, defunct... Uh, uh, I'll do my best. Um, the, uh, uh, it's a, a cause of great, genuine great disappointment for me personally because um, the BT, uh, that's a BT building. Um, the, it, it's privately owned, it was purchased by a developer and that developer came to the council with plans for quite a large development. 
Uh, I represent that area of the town and I was contacted, as you'd expect, by residents there uh, who objected and I went along to the planning committee and objected, <coughs> spoke at the planning committee and those plans were turned down. Um, they had a second go and the plans were turned down. Uh, I tried to draw the developer together with the residents and the plans that went forward, uh, came forward then were a compromise. The residents, it was more than the residents wanted in honesty, but it was a lot less than the, the first two sets uh, of uh, ideas that the developer had brought forward. Uh, those plans were passed by the planning committee some two, three years ago now, and that's the last that we've seen of them. And one of the great frustrations, I think probably for, well, I know for councillors of all political persuasions across the country, not just here <coughs> in Eastbourne, is that government says you have to have X number of new homes every year. And they set targets around that, which um, push our planners uh, to approve certain things or lose their planning powers. And yet there are a lot of planning um, applications that have been approved where the developers just sitting on them and not developing and what I'd like to see the government's planning bill do when it comes back in whatever form is address that issue because uh, they're just sitting waiting to make money uh, I'm, 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 I'm be careful I'm not referring to any particular developer there but it happens an awful lot uh, as to the, uh, the, the dairy opposite I, I'm afraid I don't know what the latest is on that there were some uh, ideas published and I know that the residents are objecting to those ideas. Um, lady in the blue there. Thank you. Um, I, I'm a bit thick sometimes about engineering business um, and it's good news that the Environment Agency is, is looking at this whole stretch of coastline. But I, I don't understand the connection between that and what's happening inside the bandstand because it looks so sad. And we walk up and down there so often, and it draws so many people. No, no I, I agree. I say we're doing some health and safety and some tidying up work. But uh, if you look at the structure, there may need to be a, a, a large investment. Now, there may be a need to actually move that because of the impact of the, 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 the waves on that part of the seafront. That's why I refer to it as not wanting to do something until we know what the Environment Agency is planning. They may be looking to, to do something quite um, dramatic there. I'm not saying that they will, but it is an area of concern because I, I don't know if you've been down the high tides, the waves come right up over there. And so uh, we, we don't want to do something which uh, then we have to dismantle or move. And at, at the redoubt, where well, we've got that blue fencing all the way mm. around, is anything happening inside the blue fencing? <laughs> Yeah, there has been some work being taken place inside the blue fencing. And as I say, I'm hoping that uh, we might see some more progress that open up some of the casements there and see uh, some enterprise going in there or attractions going into those. Um, there have been a number of ideas that have come forward. Uh, some came very close to actual fruition and then fell by the wayside. I say we have, there is somebody at the moment who is, appears to have the finance behind them to do something uh, and we just wait to see if that comes, uh, it, it turns into reality. Mm -hmm. Is there any news about the post office in Meads and the building before Nothing that I know of. I don't know, Robert, do you know anything about the post office in Meads? No, we're just in good contact with the post office. No, thank you. No, I, so I've heard nothing. And, uh, um, yeah, the, the I, I'd, I'd very happily get a letter off to Royal Mail. Uh, so, or to post office counters, isn't it there? Yes. Uh, just to say that I don't think the argument is that the post office has agreed that, it, that Meads needs a post office. Uh, we have that, um, Caroline Ansell got that undertaking. So we don't have to persuade them that we, we need a post office. All we need to do is find somewhere to have the post office, to host it. And I think that's the next thing that we're doing now. Right. Uh, so it is just get, m making sure the post office counters are actively seeking that because they can, uh, they, they, uh, I, I say this is uh, a former employee of the Royal Mail, <laughs> sometimes they're not as fast as they could be. I'm glad to hear that, that's helpful, thank you. Um, I've got lady at the back and then Lionel. Yeah. Two more questions. 
<laughs> but <laughs> but Lionel, when, when it comes to you, only uh, not not four. <laughs> okay, well let's do that now, and then we'll take the lady at the back on the left. Yes, Lionel. Yes. Sorry, it was the Meads well, Post Office. You know as well as I do, the Post Office Council, Post Office Limited, say that in every letter that they are actively seeking another trade retailer, and they expect you, the villagers, to find that for them. They will not be doing it. That, that's, that's what, that, that's what I, th I tried to allude to, perhaps less directly, Lionel, that's because right. you and I both worked for that organisation and know the way they operate. <laughs> One question, yeah. uh, l lady at the back. Work in progress at the moment. Let us update the society on that perhaps as a separate issue and maybe get one of our team along. Thank you. That's <coughs> negative, not better. We're all keen to get involved in this we, we, we had met, actually, yes. Yeah. Just, just briefly. Yeah, and you're, you're about the Eastbourne Society coming, going for that. <coughs> yeah, no, understand. <laughs> right. right. Chris, is that yes, it everything? Is. Can, can I just, bef before I finish, just say thank you very much for coming along this evening. It's great to see so many people. And can I just congratulate you on what you did in terms of Burlington Walk? Uh, I met with Nick Watson a couple of weeks ago and he said Lord Burlington was absolutely blown away with the, uh, the, the display that Eastbourne put on. That's down to your society and the Local History Society, so allow me to offer you a big round of applause on that. Thank you. 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 He never gets an easy time when he's with us. I mean, seriously, we could have had asked so many more questions. But I didn't understand politics in this town until about a year ago, and now I'm understanding it completely. And that, that sometimes the councillors are not in charge of this town. <laughs> they're not. I said there are other people that are in charge, and it's having to try and get around them and get them onto sort of same thinking. I've met them all now. I think I can even call them friends. So fingers crossed. We're going to help them move in the direction that we'd all like the town to go in, yep. but you, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, David, while you think, uh, can I have a big round of applause for David for being here? As everybody knows, I need you to pull out three of these from our heritage drawer. John, so, have you got your pen there? Yeah. The chance for three new fa friends right. and a lot more enemies. Yeah, um, okay. uh, is that, which um, way are you up to that? It's a very good question. <laughs> Well, why don't we call out both of them? It's either, it's, a, it's either nine or 16, so we'll have that as both of them. There's a line underneath it. There's a line at the bottom. No, no, no there's not. <laughs> no, there isn't. It's so, all right. It was pulled out as nine, but it's also the second one is number 16. So how's that? Number nine is Mr. and Mrs. Cumming. Mr. and Mrs. Cumming. And the second one, are we saying there's another one? 60. 60 is Keith Apple. Keith Apple. And one more. One more. Right, is 63. 63. 63 is Gwen Agis. Thank you very much. Gwen Agis. Right, we're done. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> right, well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for turning up. I said, obviously, we're in a, yeah, a hotel, so if you want to go and invite in the hotel bar, you're more than welcome to. Um, our next, uh, next catch-up uh, is for people who've got tickets, uh, and I haven't got my own yet, so uh, 14th of December, is the Christmas lunch here. Uh, there should have been forms. You, you probably got them in the Eastbourne Society magazines. Uh, the next meeting after that, obviously we're into the new year. We're back at our regular meeting, 7.30 at the Cavendish Hotel, Sussex Week downstairs. And Lord Lucas will be coming to talk to us about the Queen's Green Canopy. So uh, we look forward to that. We'll get the of all these laws these days. Thank you for coming, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> okay.